So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I can uh, ask our speakers and guests to convene and all our friends online who've been patiently waiting. Uh, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and it's my pleasure to welcome back Klaus Regling, who we were just discussing, has not only been, of course, at the forefront of European economic policy making for more than 30 years. He has graciously, every time he's gotten a new job, come here and told us what the challenges are and how he's solving them. More on that in a moment. Uh, welcome to everyone this morning. This is obviously the start of uh, meetings week, so to speak. Um, and we're very proud to once again be doing a joint event with CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation from Waterloo, Canada, and the head of the Global Economy Program, Domenico Lombardi. Uh, we've managed to do joint events together now through several of the meeting cycles, and we'll continue to do so, I hope. Uh, the Peterson Institute, as many of you know, has been concentrating on Europe and European crisis for some time, um, and includes some people, notably, of course, Jacob Kierkegaard, Anders Asl, and Fred Bergsten, and others, who have been far more optimistic about the European situation than your uh, median Anglo-American observer. We also, of course, have with us Angel Ubide, Nicholas Veron, Jay Chopra, and a number, and now Paolo Moro, a number of other experts who bring their skills to bear. And we are using Klaus's visit to remind everyone that our publication about the way forward for Europe from a macro and structural perspective is available. We also will be later this week holding a host of events uh, with senior policymakers on Europe. Um, Friday morning, bright and early, we will be releasing Anders Aslan's new book on how to fix what went wrong in Ukraine. And importantly, Finance Minister Juresko will be joining, Ukrainian Finance Minister Juresko will be joining Anders on our stage. We will have the chair of the Eurogroup with his side job of being Dutch Finance Minister, Jero and Gisselboom, excuse my pronunciation, giving a major lunch speech on Friday. Tomorrow, we will have the new European Commissioner for Competition, Ms. Versteger, who uh, has made a little news in the last couple of days with this sort of Google something or other. Uh, I suggest you come here live or watch live tomorrow for what promises to be a very exciting and topical discussion. Um, this just sort of cuts some of the highlights, and we hope you will join us either in person or via the web for these major events. We also have other events, of course, on India, on Latin America, on the global outlook. But today we are here to talk about lessons from the Euro crisis, and we have an outstanding group to do that, and most importantly, we have Klaus Regling. Klaus Regling is the managing director of the European Stability Mechanism, this is, I think, the third or fourth important European institution he's helped create. Um, he is the first managing director. He's also the CEO of the European Financial Stability Facility, which he's been since its creation in June 2010. For 38 years, he's been, as I said, and I mean this sincerely, at the forefront of economic policy making in Europe, going back to the preparations by Germany for European, the Maastricht Treaty, and then European Monetary Unification. He spent a decade then with the German Ministry of Finance. He, from 2001 to 2008, he was Director General of ECFIN, the Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission. During that period, we had the pleasure to work with him and many of his colleagues, some of whom are with us here today, and uh, in fruitful collaboration, produced a lot of research, which was just a side thing for Klaus, who was busy trying to run Europe at the time. Um, he, of course, has a further background at the IMF in Washington and Jakarta, and so is not just Europe-focused, but right now sits at the core of Europe's response to the crisis, of Europe's response to its partial union, of Europe's response to the best way forward economically. And I'd now like to ask Klaus Regling to give us his views. Thank you very much. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for the kind introduction. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be back here at the Peterson Institute, and I like to come from time to time. I followed the Institute um, actually from the time when, when Fred Bergson founded it, so it's a long, long history. So the crisis is six, seven years old, um, and I think um, in the past I often talked about our response to the crisis, but now I think we can move a little bit forward and, and begin to draw lessons from the crisis, what has worked, what has not worked, and what is the unfinished business. And I will try to do that um, as quickly as possible um, so that we have enough time for the discussion afterwards. And I'm looking forward to Reza and Domenico to give their views first. So I will talk about the five lessons from the crisis that I see. You see it here on the, on, on the screen. Um, and then I will um, talk about what to do next. For me, the five important lessons are that um, we have learned countries need to reduce their vulnerabilities um, because the next crisis will come one day. So um, those who were prepared better for the last crisis, went through the crisis more smoothly. Um, for instance, when I look at the Netherlands and Finland, two countries that economically have not done very well. Finland has had a shrinking GDP for the last three years, but they were never attacked by the markets. They never lost market access. So I think it's quite not difficult to understand why not. My second point is that um, we strengthen the governance of the euro area. A lot has happened that I will talk about that. A stronger European banking system, including banking union, is the third point. An active monetary policy um, in a crisis is an important element. And the fifth lesson is that we needed a crisis mechanism which didn't exist before. So let me go through those five points and then talk about the future. So reducing vulnerabilities, this is happening. Um, we saw in particular the countries um, that borrowed from EFSF and ESM, but basically all European countries are committed to comply with the Stability and Growth Pact, with the tightened Stability and Growth Pact. One can endlessly debate, and I'm sure we can do that here also, about the speed of the adjustment, um, but the direction, there's no disagreement. All countries in Europe, in the EU, it goes beyond the euro area, agree to move their fiscal deficits first below 3% of GDP and then run a balanced budget in structural terms. And there are some success you see on the right-hand side that the aggregate deficit of the euro area is 2.5% of GDP, so about half of what it is in, in other major um, economies. And that's also good because it means there's scope to act in case there's another need. I hope it will not come too soon, but if there is a need, um, Europe has more room for maneuver than the US, Japan, or the UK at the moment. So I think that's an important lesson. Um, competitiveness has improved massively, but again, in the countries that borrowed from the EFSF and ESM. They had lost competitiveness by 2007, 2008. It was a real homegrown element of our crisis. Um, Unfortunately, it became so clear that this homegrown element had become so important at the same time as the global financial crisis hit everybody. So we had the global financial crisis for everybody plus our homegrown European problems at the same time. And that's important to keep in mind also when we try to understand why it takes a bit longer in Europe to move out of this crisis situation. But the good news is that the countries that had lost competitiveness are restoring it or have almost restored it. That's one reason why I can't account deficits which were unsustainably large, 10 to 15, 18 percent of GDP in 2007, 2008. They have disappeared. Of course, also helped by, by um, the reduction in domestic demand, obviously, but countries have improved competitiveness and they are gaining market shares again. But it's not only um, fiscal and competitiveness, it's also um, on structural reforms. And when we look at the progress in structural reforms um, among the European countries, um, not surprisingly, the countries that borrowed from EFSF, ESM, and IMF in the context of conditionality are the 
reform champions. They are the countries that have implemented more reforms than anybody else. This is what the OECD says. Um, it's very difficult to have an indicator for structural reforms because you have to add apples and pears. But the OECD does it, um, the World Bank does it, the Lisbon Council does it, um, World Economic Forum, and they all come to the same conclusion. Greece is actually number one, not only in Europe, but when you look at the OECD area, it's f among all the OECD countries. Lisbon Council looks at the EU, and the World Bank looks at all its member states, and again, Greece is a country that has made more progress than any other country in the world during the last five years. But here it's a, in the World Bank numbers, it's, I think one can very nicely see the problem of Greece. On the one hand, they have jumped 48 um, positions during the last five years, but they are still the lowest ranked country in Europe. I think this describes well their situation. A lot of progress. That's also, I think, why one can be, if it continues, be optimistic about growth, but still a lot still needs to be done. So that's the first point. What are the countries doing? Um, and they should have done many of these things before, not let competitiveness deteriorate so much, not have such a weak fiscal position. I think that's one important lesson for the future. Second, governance in the euro area, how to improve economic policy coordination. Again, a lot has happened the last few years. The Stability and Growth Pact um, was tightened. Importantly, less interference is possible from the political side. Um, it's important to understand how the EU works with proposals from the Commission that need to be um, then endorsed in the Council. Now, with the revised Stability Pact, proposals from the Commission become European law unless there's a qualified majority against that proposal. And that's very difficult to organize by the sinners. If we had had this um, set up already in 2003, the proposal from the Commission to take Germany and France to the next level in the excessive deficit procedure would have passed the Council. Um, at the time, we needed a qualified majority in favor, and that was much easier to block. Importantly, also, the European fiscal rules are now integrated into national legal systems, which means in the future when a country breaks a European rule, it will also break its own national rule. So another hurdle. We have a European semester to coordinate earlier um, fiscal policies in member states. We have country-specific recommendations to every country um, how to remove obstacles to growth. And importantly, the whole surveillance process has been broadened much beyond the initial focus on the fiscal side. With hindsight, I think it is another lesson. It was a mistake to mainly focus on fiscal. Fiscal is, plays an important role in the monetary union because the spillover effects can be massive. But we were too narrow. Um, now we know, and that's a clear lesson, that one also has to monitor regularly what happens to competitiveness, current account balances, credit cycles, and all of that. I remember the debate um, early last decade when monetary union started, whether we still needed statistics on current account for euro area countries. Um, there were serious people who said we don't need that anymore. Um, now we know that it was very good to keep those statistics, but we should have paid more attention to them. So another clear lesson. The final point here is Eurostat. Many people are not aware that Eurostat has now a lot more power than before the crisis. Um, they could not go to the countries before the crisis and check the data that were given from the countries to Eurostat. Eurostat could only collect, harmonize the definitions and publish. And that's why it was possible for Greece to report wrong budget data for a decade. Today, impossible, um, because Eurostat goes and checks. So another very clear lesson um, and um, real progress that this kind of problem that all of a sudden a country has a deficit of 15% of GDP cannot happen again. It's just not feasible. Third area to look at um, is the banking system. Um, again, a lot has happened, um, very clear lessons. Um, new institutions have been created already some years ago for the supervision of banking, securities, um, insurance markets. 
ESRB, not well known, the European Systemic Risk Board, but with the important task of monitoring macro prudential risks. Another lesson, I think not only in Europe, such institutions did not ex exist before the crisis. Also the US, the UK have created similar institutions, but they are even more important um, in the monetary union because on the macro prudential side, one can um, adopt country specific tools, which monetary policy cannot, to fight national credit cycles, um, real estate bubbles and things like that. So potentially very important in the monetary union. Financial market reform Europe, of course, is part of the global um, debate and decision-making process in Basel and the G20. I will not go into the details, but important to realize that European banks, these are the EU banks, not only Euro area, have basically doubled their capital since 2008. They added 560 billion euro, and that's a doubling. Then the banking union started in November 2014 with the Sung Sing supervisory mechanism. We have a new bank recovery and resolution directive that will govern the bail-in of bank creditors in the future. There's a single resolution mechanism um, being built up, single resolution fund, um, which will um, be built up over eight years. At the ESM, we have a new instrument, the direct bank recapitalization instrument. All these are important elements to, um, again, make create a unified banking market in the euro area. It had become very fragmented with negative consequences for the real economy. Um, I think all these measures that have been put in place go a long way to correct that, although we are not at the end. I'm not saying that. It's not, not everything is in perfect shape, obviously. Monetary policy has played a key role, obviously, during this crisis. Um, the ECB, like other big central banks around the world had to adopt measures that during normal times um, would never have been adopted. Um, the ECB actually started early already in 2007. It was the first central bank that did something when the crisis started emerging. Um, I'm listing here the different things that they have done. OMT was important in September 2012, has not been used, but it's um, there could have been an effective cooperation between the ECB and the ESM. There are LTRO and T, LTRO, quantitative easing, you are all familiar with that, I think. Um, the monthly purchases of 60 billion euro um, started last month. Um, I think Mario is doing his press conference now, so I appreciate you listening to me and not to him. Um, but I expect that he will just um, reinforce the messages he has given um, after the previous meeting when, when QE was announced. You see here the balance sheet of the ECB, where indeed we see that um, it, it um, reached the peak in 2012, has been declining since, and now the idea is through QE to build it up to previous levels. The five point, fifth point, um, talking about lessons, is the establishment of crisis mechanism. It didn't exist. The founding fathers of the euro could not imagine that a member state of the euro area could lose market access was just unthinkable. Um, therefore, um, we never thought, and I include myself, that we would need institutions like this. Um, when we saw in 2010, early 2010, that a Greek package was not enough to um, return to normal situation, the EFSF was created in May, June 2010. Then in October 2012, the ESM. They have the same instruments, the same mandate and mission. The legal setup is quite different, also the capital structure is different. EFSF works with guarantees, ESM works with capital. Um, both institutions have to go to the markets first before they can make a loan, so very different from the IMF setup. But like the IMF, we only provide financing to countries that accept conditionality in the context of an agreed reform package. During the almost five years, these two institutions, EFSF and ESM, have lent to five countries. The EFSF to Ireland, Portugal, and Greece, ESM to Spain and Cyprus. Three of these countries have exited their programs by now. Together, we have dispersed 232 billion euro, which during this period was two to three times as much as the IMF dispersed globally. Um, and of course, the programs for Greece and Cyprus are ongoing 
disbursements are possible, but as always, only if conditionality is met. ESF and ESM lending has been quite important, as Adam um, hinted at. Um, firstly, if the ESF had not been created, I'm sure, I'm afraid, some of our member states would no longer be in the euro area. And I think if that had happened, Europe would be a different place today. But it goes beyond that. Through EFSF ESM programs, we promoted fiscal adjustment and structural reforms in these countries, as I tried to show in my earlier slides. And that means that these countries will be the most dynamic countries in Europe if they continue their reforms. They will be more dynamic than the rest, um, which I think is an important second point here. Those, and you do it much more than people in Europe who follow the IMF activities know that, of course, after countries like Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia went through their painful IMF programs, a few years later they were the most dynamic countries in the world economy. I expect the same for the countries that borrowed from us if they continue their reforms. The third point um, I think is still debated a lot, and I'm sure we will get to that looking at RAZA here. Um, um, many people think um, that more needs to be done on the debt side. My argument is that through our favorable lending terms, very low interest rates, very long term, we have created a new framework in Europe that didn't exist before. The starting point was the IMF arrangement, but we have developed it into something unique that provides tremendous benefits to the countries that receive borrowing from us in this table. We tried to quantify this um, for the year 2013, and you see that for Greece, which received more financial assistance than anybody else, the benefit in 2013 alone amounts to 8.6 billion euro. This is a benefit for the budget, for the country, and that's equivalent to 4.7% of GDP. It's an enormous benefit, and one has to understand that to see that with continued reforms, um, and continued benefits of this size every year, the country can return to debt sustainability without another haircut. The last advantage of having now EFSF, ESM in the euro area is that we do have a land of last resort. I think many people in Europe had not realized that that was missing um, because in a national context, in a crisis, a central bank is not only the land of last resort for banks, but also for the sovereign. In the euro area, this doesn't work, because um, if the ECB were to play that role, um, it means shifting risks um, among countries, and then national governments and parliaments want to get involved. So now we can do this at EFSF, ESM. So quite beneficial to have these institutions, but it took us a while to realize that. So a lot has happened, um, but the story is not over. Um, there is unfinished business to do, um, and I will talk about governance and fiscal capacity in this context. Um, I try to be very precise here and, and identify measures that can be taken without changing the EU treaty, because those who know Europe well understand that changing the treaty takes a long time, is very risky, may not um, be passed in some countries because it has to be unanimous. Five or six countries need a referendum. And it's just unpredictable if it in the end um, passes or not. So it's a risky undertaking and takes a lot of political energy to get started. So what I'm talking about does not require the EU treaty change. And the second point that I consider to be important is to find measures that don't lead to further debt mutualization. But I come to that in the context of fiscal capacity. First on governance, I think there's a realization more and more that our rules-based system, which was crucial at the start of monetary union, is still crucial um, because with centralized monetary policy, decentralized fiscal and economic policies, rules are essential, otherwise it cannot work. But some of them have now become so complicated that there are not many people left to understand them. Savas is probably the only one here. Um, so there is a problem. And that's why people like Mario Draghi say we need to move to more joint decision making and stronger institutions and not rely only on rules. 
we will never abolish the rules, but some have become so complicated that it's better to pass the judgment, let institutions take the judgment. And I think this is important to think about um, because the incomplete monetary union holds back investment growth and employment. So what could be done? Um, several proposals are on the table. This is not, um, not very creative, but you have heard talks about uh, permanent euro area um, um, president, euro area finance minister, not in the sense that all the budgets are pooled, but maybe certain parts of the budget, or somebody who monitors more strictly the commonly agreed rules. Um, another proposal is to have a fiscal capacity for the euro area. I will say a few words on that in a moment. Joint decision making for structural reforms. But it also means we need more democratic accountability and legitimacy. All these things are not easy, but I think um, if one wants to, one can do it without treaty change, um, even though it is politically and legally not, not easy. We do have an instrument in the EU treaty called enhanced cooperation that could be used for this purpose. Um, if that is too complicated, one has to move to intergovernmental arrangements at least for a while till one day the treaty change may come. More risk sharing is something that's often demanded, particularly by academics, particularly in this country. Um, not always fully realizing that there is already a lot of risk sharing, more than people realize. Through the EFSF, the ESM, and I gave you the numbers, we dispersed 230 billion euro in four years. But also through the EIF, in the future through the Single Resolution Fund, um, elements of monetary policy, of course, have some risk sharing in it, Target, for instance but also others. Additional ideas that are under discussion um, are rainy day funds um, that could be used during difficult times, common system of unemployment benefits, different ways to, to organize it, either give a minimum um, benefit to everybody out of this fund, which then needs to be commonly financed, or have a fund that only steps in when, when the unemployment moves above a normal situation in a certain member state, so to help that country if it's, for instance, hit by an asymmetric shock. Um, targeted fiscal capacity has been discussed to reward structural reforms. And of course, to the extent that we can finalize banking union and capital markets union, this will allow more risk sharing through um, private channels, through, through private um, financial markets. So again, as I said, all this could be organized without treaty change, without debt mutualization, and without permanent transfers. Completing banking union in that context um, would be good, would be important. There's talk about the capital markets union now. Um, I already mentioned the SRF. Um, there's still the need to have a decision on a backstop for the SRF um, in eight years' time at the latest. Um, one could take out um, old proposals to harmonize consolidate deposit guarantee schemes, which in a way would complete banking union. Um, and I think it's necessary to think more actively about how to promote private sector deleveraging. This is clearly an area where we have not done as well as other countries, as the US and the UK. Um, here you see some of the data. Um, one can see that private sector debt in the euro area today is actually higher than it was in 2007, while UK, US, um, it has fallen. Um, situation varies a lot country by country, also between private household debt and corporate debt. On the right-hand side, you see, for instance, that household debt um, on a gross basis is fairly low in Europe. It's the blue line compared to the other countries. So, um, but the corporate sector, I think, um, needs, we need to think about it um, by harmonizing, for instance, um, insolvency procedures. It takes, um, in some countries, one or two years to conclude an insolvency procedure. In other countries, it takes 10 or 12 years. Um, and I think that's an area where we need to spend more time on. I think that would all go a long way to um, strengthen the resilience of AMU. Um, I don't think we need a fiscal union, a full fiscal union to make AMU work successfully. But to think about a treaty change has some advantages. 
um, as I said, it will take a long time, um, but one could incorporate intergovernmental agreements into the treaty. ESM could be integrated into the treaty. The single supervisor could be taken out of the ECB, uh, make an independent institution. Um, the commission, in my view, should become a more political body, which then also means that certain tasks have to be given up, like competition policy. Um, all this clearly difficult, not easy, politically difficult, um, legally difficult, um, not terribly urgent if one makes progress on the other things that I mentioned. Let me add here so that we have some time to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, of course, there is always this translation issue among friends across the Atlantic. He hears uh, debt mutualization. I hear foolish lenders paying for their moral hazard. But you know, potato, potato. Um, on that note, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the Institute Reza Mogadam. Uh, Reza is now Vice Chairman for Global Capital Markets at Morgan Stanley, where he's been for about six months. He deals with sovereign debt issues throughout the world in that capacity. But of course, like Klaus, he had a long and distinguished career at the forefront of economic policy, in his case at the IMF. He was director of the European Department at the Fund from November 11 to July 2014, a particularly good period to be doing that job. Um, prior to that, he had the more relaxing job of being director of the Fund Strategy, Policy, and Review Department for three years. Um, he had worked for the managing director directly under both Dorato and Strauss-Kahn. He worked in European and Asia Pacific departments and obviously is as qualified an insider to give a perspective on what the hard choices and the kinds of building to emphasize that Klaus has overseen with his colleagues how much that has made a difference, how much that follows the lessons we want to be followed. So Reza, if you could give us some remarks. Thank you, Adam, and uh, good to be back in Washington and see so many familiar faces, both from Washington and from the rest of the world. And I have not made any prepared uh, remarks, but uh, uh, Klaus has provided a lot of fruit for thought, and I, maybe I make some reflections based on my experience uh, at the fund and since then on some of the some of the issues that he mentioned. Um, uh, I, I suppose if I look back at the European crisis or the uh, more generally global crisis, but mainly the European crisis, I think at the beginning of the of the crisis, what I recall was people trying to come up with solutions, but under three constraints. They wanted a solution to the European crisis with three constraints. No exit, no bailout, no debt restructuring. That was the initial framework. And two of the three had to be sacrificed to save the third. And a lot of what, what uh, Klaus put in place, uh, was part of putting in place, what he described today, was in a way uh, providing a framework for restructuring, providing a framework for bailout, and using those to reform the economies in order to be more competitive. And at the same time, putting in place uh, mechanisms for the crisis to be prevented in the future by addressing the underlying causes of the, of the problem. Some were fiscal, but I think uh, Klaus put his finger on it uh, uh, in terms of competitiveness, the ability to stay in the Eurozone, to be able to be as competitive as the median uh, economy, and close to that, because divergences will not allow you to, uh, to uh, remain uh, competitive within the zone. And so many, many of the, of the actions that were taken were in line, in line with those. And I think Europe has made enormous progress when you think that at the beginning, uh, I remember April 2010 or just before that, 
where uh, the discussion was, no, we could not help Greece, we could not have a financial package uh, because it would be a bailout, it would be a uh, it would be it would be in, not be in line with the uh, with the treaty and where we are now. Not only Klaus is heading to institutions which are in charge of uh, providing financing, uh, there the whole infrastructure of the discussions around Europe, around countries, enforcement. Uh, Klaus mentioned uh, monitoring and surveillance. There's been a huge uh, improvement in those in terms of putting in place mechanisms on the fiscal and so on. But I think I would like to push a few of the issues um, where I see where progress has been made, but maybe some of the issues have not yet been addressed in terms of the uh, fundamental, fundamental problems that we face or the fundamental structures uh, that are there. Let me, let me mention a few. Uh, fiscal rules. It is certainly the case that there is now an elaborate system of assessing, making sure a country's fiscal uh, uh, budgets are in line with an overall understanding. But what, what I, the question to me is, do the rules themselves make sense as they are? What has happened in Europe throughout the crisis is recognizing that the rules are imperfect trying to amend them to provide flexibility and at the same time making it more complex. So I think, Klaus, you mentioned not many people uh, are there, perhaps uh, Servas here, who can explain to us whether or not Italy currently meets the rules. Uh, it, so there is, a, there is a constructive ambiguity, but the question is, do the rules makes sense in terms of what, what you need to achieve. So does the, does the overall 3% target still make sense? Now, it has been supplemented with uh, structural balances, with uh, debt reduction targets in a fairly complicated system where you have to reduce a little bit of your debt if you're above a certain level. These are not easy to explain. Not only they're not easy to explain, they, in my view, sometimes they undermine the, the political support, social support for these rules because they are complicated to tell people how, whether or not a country uh, meets. And I completely agree with some of the issues that Klaus mentioned in terms of uh, centralization, greater central budgets, uh, more uh, decision making uh, in groupings by, by uh, European finance ministers, possi possibly um, a Euro finance minister uh, appointment as a, as a permanent uh, feature, and what you said in terms of political support. But political support also needs rules that are easy to explain and uh, uh, for people to connect to. So a little bit more on the fiscal. So, so very difficult to understand why everybody, irrespective of where the debt level or the economic level is, needs to be bound by the 3%, by the, by the minus 0.5% structural deficit. I think it makes much more sense to be able to differentiate based on the level of debt and where countries need to be and therefore determine the speed of adjustment. Now, you could say that exists, that exists in the current framework, but it's bloody difficult to get at it uh, in a very simple, transparent way. So that on, on the fiscal front. Banking. I think uh, I completely agree with Klaus. This was, I was surprised during the process uh, in 2011, 2012, and 13, how uh, quick Europe was to recognize that banking union was needed. Um, I remember being at meetings in early 2012, I think it was, and the concept of banking union was alien to many people in the policy meetings. And 
the crisis was an impetus, but the logic of why it needed to be done was also persuasive. It was also an easy, going back to explaining to the public, it was an easy narrative to explain to the public why it was necessary and why it made sense. And so I was pleasantly surprised how quickly Europe moved to put that in place. And if you look at key initiatives in the last uh, three, four years, I will put that pretty much uh, near the top, top of the list. And the associated uh, asset quality review, which was done with that, and the comprehensive assessment, I think was very important, very late in the game, if you look at it compared to the, what the US did. Uh, but incredibly important, by the time this was done, I was, I was in the markets, and the market perception of the importance of this was, was quite uh, striking to me. Uh, so it was very important. The issue to me, again, to try and push the envelope further on this issue, the, the issue to me is whether they were strong enough in terms of uh, what came out of the, of, the, of the asset quality review and what to do about it, even if they were not uh, ever strong enough. When you see what has happened to European assets, shares, European shares, partly in response to asset, uh, partly in response to uh, quantitative easing, have been surging ahead. But that has not been the case with the banking system, despite the improvement uh, before asset quality review. So that is a question mark. Why is that, and uh, what can be done about it? I think this uh, this is, to me, an incredibly important issue. And, I, and uh, since I've been to the markets, I have become uh, much more convinced that this is uh, a key for the European economy to, in, to accelerate its growth. And let me give you a few examples. Uh, wh what am I proposing? I think what needs to, to happen is for the European supervisors, SSM, the, 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 the uh, uh, individual supervisors, to be much more aggressive in terms of forcing banks to get the bad assets out of their books. Now, there are ideas of um, uh, um, central uh, bad banks and uh, putting it, solving it on your, uh, on, your, on your balance sheet and so on. And I've come to the conclusion since I've seen some of this in practice over the last six months, that the best way to generate economic growth and recovery is to actually push those assets out of the banks to be resolved. I, I give you a couple of examples of what I've seen uh, in the markets. Uh, Ireland. Um, Ireland started this process about 18 months ago, and uh, they were initially reluctant to put things on the market, and they were reluctant because they thought the prices were too low, and they were. They were definitely underpriced in the markets initially. They started putting it on the market at uh, prices of something around uh, under, just under 30 cents to the dollar in the first tranche. By the time they were done, the last tranches were sold for about 90 cents to the dollar. And most interestingly, this is not um, be fire sales and being uh, uh, market people trying to, uh, to uh, uh, get hold of cheap assets. It's quite different. Specialist firms looking at this, very large firms looking at this, uh, and assessing the, the quality of the assets and being able to negotiate directly with the borrowers. And what was interesting to me, when this process happened in Ireland, actually some of the loans ended up being back in the banks. Those who resolved it put it back in the banks uh, because that was where the relationship was. They took their profit. They, they were able to give a haircut. They were able to assess whether or not you needed to resolve the assets. And another very interesting thing, most of the assets were not actually foreclosed. Foreclosure was necessary as a threat. Most of the assets were resolved, were made good assets. They were not foreclosed. They were put back on the banks. And the same thing, to some extent, is happening in, uh, in uh, Spain following the, some of the changes that they have made in the, in the regulatory framework. So th to me, this 
is another issue, important issue going forward in terms of accelerating. Uh, get, uh, now, there has been the AQR. In theory, cap the capital of the banks should be adequate. This process will make, it, make sure whether it is adequate or not, but more importantly, it would, it would initiate a process where you have recovery activity and, and growth uh, back in the economies. And I, I can tell you from where uh, I sit right now uh, in a bank, the countries which are doing this, there's definitely a greater degree of activity, definitely higher growth. Now, another, another issue which um, uh, perhaps uh, um, I was reminded of when Klaus was talking. If I look back at the, at the uh, crisis management over the last five years, I would say there was one uh, overriding issue which we as technocrats and even politicians were, did not pay sufficient uh, attention to. What, what I'm always uh, uh, impressed by is the solidarity within Europe. It's a messy process. It's a difficult process. Uh, we have continuously meetings which don't get anywhere, but there is a degree of solidarity among Europeans uh, that in most of the cases, let's say 17 out of 18 cases, has led to a solution. And uh, but there, there is one issue which has always uh, 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 puzzled me, and that is there is often inadequate, while each of the politicians think about their constituency and uh, back home, there is, all, uh, uh, there is often inadequate um, attention to how measures would be perceived socially and in terms of uh, uh, social sustainability going down the road. And I think you know, there are a lot of problems in Greece, but that is one of them. We did not think adequately about the scale of the problem and that, what that means in terms of the impact on the society and the political outcome. It matters at the end of the day. And so while the scale of the challenge is very high and what needs to be done very high, the European solidarity which has been there almost everywhere needs to play a role in terms of how you adjust socially and what the political impact is. And this is not an easy issue and it's not an easy issue to go across borders, but looking back, and you know, I am as guilty as anybody, um, I think it is an issue where I certainly, uh, when I was at the fund, I don't think I paid adequate attention to it. But let me just finish, Adam, I know we're running out of time, with a few words on Greece, because um, Klaus talked about uh, many of the positive things that have happened in Europe, and I, I agree almost entirely with what he said and his focus on uh, the measures and, and his... Uh, forward-looking focus, but Europe also needs a solution to Greece. And I, I, am, I am somewhat, uh, uh, I'm getting depressed uh, just reading about what is happening not being involved because there is uh, this sense of fatalism. Uh, there is a sense of blame, uh, there is a sense of fatalism. My hope is that spirit of solidarity that I've seen in Europe will overcome this. Uh, but. Uh, the Eurozone is the adult in this process. And what, what I find uh, uh, disappointing is certainly the way uh, the new Greek government has been unable to put credible strategy forward and unable to engage and unable to understand the severity of the situation. But I think we also need to look on Europe because Europe has done this many times for other countries, including for Greece. And so I still think it is not too late, although when you talk to people, everybody has this sense of fatalism. 
there, it is possible, taking into account what has happened there politically, what is happening there socially, to put into place or ask for a limited set of important things and really test the government whether or not they are able to do it. A limited, not a 26-page document, a limited one page of actions. If they cannot do it, okay, that's the end of the road. But I, I do feel that a strategy right now is missing and an accident there, um, you know, I sit in the markets, markets are incredibly positive about Europe right now. Whether you talk about equities, whether you talk about fixed income, um, but believe me, most of that has got to do with QE. You have a huge uh, purchaser of assets uh, in, the, in the market, uh, and QE has had a huge effect, it will continue to have, and it's a very good uh, safety net, uh, but it is not because people believe that the European growth prospects have improved and confidence has improved. Uh, these things are very fragile. Thank you. Thank you very much for that multifaceted set of comments on the fly, Reza. You are, of course, steeped in this, and you are right, I fully believe, to be picking up Klaus's forward-looking emphasis on what's been built in Europe. I, I would just suggest, in terms of the growth prospects for Europe, you might look at our presentation of the Global Outlook last Tuesday, uh, in which uh, Jacob Kierkegaard made a strong case that there is real reason that uh, a well-capitalized banking system, as you and Klaus both pointed to, interacting with QE following the AQR provides an additional floor, among other things. Um, I'd now like to turn to Domenico Lombardi for a slightly more outside perspective. Domenico, of course, is well known to many of us here in Washington and around the world. He is the director of the Center for International Governance Innovation, our friends at CG's um, Global Economy Program, the founding director. It doesn't sound quite as good as being the man who founded the EFSF like Klaus, but it's good. Um, and, uh, of course, has had distinguished tenure at the IMF and the World Bank. He also serves as chair of the Oxford Institute for Economic Policy, the Bretton Woods Committee. Um, he's, he's a member of their advisory board. He's an advisor with us and partners with us. And uh, would like to hear his take on governance going forward in Europe. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Adam, for putting this together. This has become a tradition for both Siege and Peterson on the eve of uh, the annual and the spring meetings. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be back uh, here in Washington. Uh, also, uh, let me uh, reiterate that uh, at CG, uh, we're very pleased with the partnership with your institution, Adam. And we look forward uh, to further ways to enhancing and nurturing it. Uh, so um, <clears throat> let me come to uh, today's topic. What I'm going to do is uh, first to um, uh, react to some of uh, Klaus's comments and his presentation. But I'm also going to draw on uh, some research that uh, I've been doing at CG. Uh, CG focuses on uh, global issues and certainly the Eurozone is an important uh, topic in that respect. And the research I'm going to draw from is a joint research that I've done with my CG colleague, uh, Samantha Santamandu, sitting uh, back there. Uh, so I think one way of summarizing what uh, uh, Klaus has said uh, is that there, is, there has been progress at both the policy level and at the institutional level. But what I would add is that this convergence process uh, is uh, also far from complete. And of course, the sustainability of this convergence process um, is, is still uh, um, uh, at least partly uncertain. And uh, I'm going to go through uh, a number of points uh, and uh, um, I will, uh, uh, as I said, complement in many respects what Klaus has been um, saying in his presentation. So if we look, for instance, at microeconomic imbalances, uh, we do see, and, and we focus our attention to intra-Eurozone uh, goods trade, uh, 
uh, we see that uh, uh, you know, some of uh, these imbalances have uh, uh, reduced to a greater extent. Of course, at the current account uh, level, this is uh, less evident, or as Klaus indicated, uh, actually the adjustment has been working mainly through the debtor side. In fact, yesterday the IMF's WIO released the new numbers and I was looking at the current account on Germany. Well, it has increased from last year and right now it is projected for the current year at 8.4%. Uh, uh, um, clearly, <coughs> the adjustment uh, uh, in that regard from the Southern economies is something well taken. It is also true that these economies are not at full potential, and therefore, uh, you know, um, uh, we shouldn't overemphasize this apparent convergence. In terms of ULC, uh, we see uh, some uh, um, convergence. We see convergence in a number of countries from the periphery, uh, partly because Germany is uh, helping in that regard, partly because these countries, in, for instance, Greece or uh, Portugal, have been uh, uh, introducing measures that have facilitated that convergence. Uh, there are still some exceptions. Italy, in particular, is a big outlier if you look at ULC uh, dynamics, and, uh, um, and, and, and therefore, uh, you know, this is uh, something worth uh, noting. Um, in terms of the regulatory environment, uh, we also see some convergence. And uh, uh, partly this is due to the fact that, uh, again, some of the periphery economies have been implementing a number of structural reforms in the context of the Troika programs. They, and therefore, their ranking uh, in uh, some of the le leading services has been lifted up. Um, uh, again, Klaus referred to that. And what is also uh, evident is that uh, not just uh, the lower performers have been improving on their ranking uh, in, say, for instance, the ease of uh, doing business uh, survey conducted by the World Bank, but also uh, the range between uh, the top performers and the lower performers ha has been reducing. And also the dispersion uh, in the various uh, Eurozone economies uh, has also been uh, reduced by a number of metrics uh, that you can use to assess uh, um, uh, relative dispersion. So uh, this is certainly this is certainly a welcome uh, a welcome development. Um, from the in terms of the institutional uh, developments, uh, let me focus. Uh, I think uh, Klaus referred to broader institutional developments. I want to flag a couple of points on uh, the ESM itself, and I've been studying. Uh, um, uh, regional and plurilateral financial arrangements and comparing them to um, um, among themselves as well as vis-a-vis -vis the IMF. Clearly the, IM the ESM has a number of uh, uh, novel institutional features. Uh, it can provide direct recapitalizations to uh, uh, financial institutions, can intervene in primary and secondary markets, uh, and it can borrow from, uh, from financial markets. Um, However, uh, you know, the size, the lending capacity of the SM, especially if we want to um, benchmark it or assess it as a uh, lender of last resort for sovereigns, uh, well, then the lending capacity of the, the ESM is still uh, relatively limited, currently standing at 500 billion euros. And in a way, this um, uh, sort of uh, um, limits its uh, effectiveness in functioning as uh, a lender of last resort if larger peripheral economies, say, such as uh, li like Italy or Spain, were uh, to run into, um, into uh, difficulties. Um, so this is one, uh, one uh, point I'd like to stress. And then the second is, uh, I was, uh, of course, looking at uh, um, Klaus' presentation, uh, Klaus' slides on the banking union and the uh, improved regulatory framework. Uh, as we all know, there is a bail-in provision for investors. Um, uh, but then I see a slight tension between, on the one hand, introducing the bail-in provision for investors in the context of uh, the banking union, but then on the other, um, uh, leaving a little bit uh, outside of the box uh, the issue of uh, an orderly uh, sovereign debt restructuring for um, for uh, Eurozone economies. 
And clearly, if uh, your financing capacity is not large enough, um, um, uh, of course, you, uh, you, know, you may want to consider a, uh, a framework where crisis resolution can be more orderly and where there can be more predictability. Um, maybe the, uh, acting on its own, this is not the right strategy moving forward, but I was a little bit surprised to see uh, that uh, when in September there was a debate within the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, towards the resolution for an orderly and comprehensive framework, some key European countries, for instance, voted against. And therefore, what I'm suggesting is that uh, uh, this is still a missing piece in the European governance, especially because the Eurozone is a monetary union, but it is uh, uh, clearly not uh, a, um, a union, uh, a federal union in the same way the US is. And therefore, uh, you know, if the ECB cannot act as a lender of last resort, unlimited lender of last resort, if the ESM's financial capacity is constrained, uh, is constrained at such a level that uh, might compromise its ability to uh, work with the larger sovereigns of the euro area, then I would argue you do need uh, a framework that uh, um, correct for um, this, uh, 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 this um, uh, gap. And I believe this is also something uh, Reza was hinting at when he was recalling, uh, he was recalling the uh, impossible triangle uh, at the height of the Eurozone crisis. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, could be done, as I said, in the context of the European uh, process, but of course there are other international fora. The UN is one of them, uh, the IMF is another one, or as well, or the G20. So there are a plurality of fora in which this uh, debate uh, could uh, uh, be uh, revamped and could be uh, supported. And I think the Eurozone would uh, greatly benefit, benefit exactly for the reasons that we have been discussing here this morning. So um, I'm going to stop here, Adam. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, thanks uh, for putting this together. If I could ask our Klaus and our two discussants to come up on stage, and uh, let's put Klaus in the middle at the center of things and ask you to attach a microphone. This allows me to have the commercial break to advertise the Peterson Institute, of course. As I mentioned earlier, uh, under leadership of Angel Ubide, we earlier released a study, Rebuilding Europe's Common Future, Combining Growth and Reform in the Euro Area, with contributions by Jay Chopra, Nicholas Veron, Jacob Kierkegaard, Paolo Maro, and Angel. And this, in a sense, I urge you to read as a complement to what Klaus was talking about and may push in some different ways. I also just want to pick up on something that uh, Domenico just said, which is the issue of debt restructuring, which, of course, is critical potentially for Europe, within Euro, um, but also, of course, for Ukraine, for Argentina. Some of you may recall, and I'll refer you on the website to an, an interesting event we held here about three weeks ago with Seth Hagen from the IMF, with some colleagues from McKinsey, and in particular featuring the analysis of our colleague Anna Gelpern, who's been doing groundbreaking work on this, and I hope you'll take a look. Um, but now that our colleagues are seated and mic'd, uh, I will just first ask Klaus if there's anything particular he briefly wants to respond to from either Reza or Domenico, knowing that Klaus does occasionally like to respond to things. Um, because occasionally I don't agree. That's yeah. just, <laughs> maybe on the point you also just picked up, and it is an important aspect. It's discussed widely. Do we need a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism in the euro area? In my view, no. We don't, countries in the euro area are not like Argentina or Ukraine. They benefit from the solidarity that um, Reza talked about, you talked about. I showed some numbers that um, through our favorable terms, favorable lending terms, very low interest rates, um, very long term maturities for Greece, I didn't mention earlier, we even have a deferral of the interest obligations during the first 10 years. There's a lot of um, solidarity adding up in the case of Greece to 4.5% of GDP annually. So that will help the countries that have or that seem to have unsustainable debt levels now. 
that's the conclusion that people sometimes have when they only look at the debt to GDP ratio, which is inadequate. Um, because you can have a very high debt to GDP ratio, look at Japan, when the associated um, debt service is relatively low. And we have created a system in Europe that makes that possible. And then together with the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact, where Razor thinks we should um, refine it and, and make it even better. Um, but overall, as I said, there's no disagreement that for a number of reasons, um, we want to move not to deficits of 3%, that's a secondary rule. The main rule is balanced budget, budgets in structural terms, which means the deficit, of course, can fluctuate um, with the cycle. Um, but given the high debt levels and the unfavorable demographics in Europe, um, this is a consensus view. And so if we follow these rules, and for those cases that are very difficult now, like Greece, we have our lending in place. Um, I don't see why we need then in the future uh, sovereign debt um, restructuring mechanism. It will not be needed in the euro area. It may be needed for some other countries. Maybe I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, so we're, we're, we are on the record. I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. Jessica has a moving mic here up front. <coughs> uh, others can go to the back mic uh, where they can be recognized. Um, so first, why don't we start here with this gentleman. If you could identify yourself and, and uh, pretend you're asking a question rather than making a statement. <laughs> Thank you, Malcolm Knight, uh, CGN, and the London School of Economics. I have a question uh, for Klaus, but maybe for the other commentators as well. I don't think any of you mentioned or only mentioned en passant um, the single resolution mechanism. And it seems to me that that's quite an important element in principle in uh, reducing, mitigating the risk of, um, of too big to fail in Europe, particularly in a situation where going forward the banks in Europe um, look like with their current business model are going to have a relatively low return on capital. So there are going to be huge structural changes here. How important is this um, single resolution mechanism and what's needed to, if anything, to make sure that it actually will work when it's needed? Well, I, respond? I, I, I oh, assume yeah. you guys can take care of yourselves, okay. please. I don't know whether you want to collect sorry, sorry, questions, sorry. but I am no. happy to, to make some remarks and others will step in. I think it's a key element of the banking union, absolutely. Without the single um, restruct, the SRF, um, it wouldn't work um, because one needs to pre be prepared for the adjustments. Um, um, Europe is overbanked, as the IMF always points out. So there will be um, some structural changes. To have an SRF is key. Some people have said it's too small. Um, others are critical that it takes eight years to build it up, but this is a good European tradition to start slowly. Um, if in a few years we come to the conclusion it's too small, um, I'm sure it will be possible to, to beef it up. Um, it's important to get started. It's also um, important because it adds to, to um, risk sharing in the euro area, because this is really a a mutualized pot of money that will be available eventually, fed by all the participating banks. As I said earlier, what's still missing is to have a backstop. Like in the US, um, the US Treasury provides this backstop. It's always in the national context easier to organize this um, than in a monetary union with 19 countries. Um, but we will get to that point. Um, there's clearly the intention of the euro area to return to this question. It was marked as a as um, to be resolved um, during the built-up phase of the SRF. So I can only share your view. It's really a key thing. Reza, you're in banks at the moment. What do you think? <laughs> no, I, th I think this is uh, another area where there has been a major evolution in, uh, uh, in Europe. I think seeing Jay stand up there reminds me of the debate we had uh, about the senior debt in Ireland. Uh, the debates we had on uh, uh, how to manage the resolution of banks in Cyprus and the final bailing there. And uh, um, I think 
the single resolution mechanism is in a way a conclusion of all those debates, a recognition that you need mechanisms uh, in order to deal with uh, uh, hopefully rare circumstances, that you need rules of the game uh, so that the private sector, the banking sector, and borrowers and lenders are aware of the, uh, they have the right incentive structure. So I think it's important from all those perspectives. Uh, maybe I comment also on the debt restructuring issue. Small. Look, uh, debt restructuring is a fact of life in the world. Economies get into trouble. Um, almost uh, doesn't matter what level of debt. Uh, you can think of many countries from different levels of debt have got into. So you need a mechanism. The same way you need to resolve banks, you need a mechanism to resolve uh, unsustainable debt in countries. That was nice and short. Uh, Domenico, I want to go to more questions. Do you have anything short on the debt restructuring issue? Uh, well, clearly there are different views whether Eurozone economies might need or benefit of a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. My point is that uh, regardless of the view you, you hold, still the Eurozone is an important stakeholder at the international level and as such should be promoting a better uh, debt architecture at the international level which may or may not uh, uh, be triggered or benefit uh, any of its economies. Uh, um, at the time of the next crisis, and regardless of that. Great. Uh, Jay, and then here. Uh, could you say who you are, please? Klaus? We don't have such a mechanism in place. Um, we are busy enough going through this transition period coming from high deficits, which we have to remember were decided, it was a deliberate decision after Lehman in the context of the G20 to have fiscal stimulus. Um, and that was one reason why the deficits shot up. Um, so it was um, a discretionary fiscal action at the time. So in a way that was a decision that had to be taken at the national level because only the national parliaments can, can adopt um, such measures. But it also added up to an overall fiscal stimulus for the euro area as a whole. So, but this was really the exception. Now we are in the transition period um, from these high deficits to um, get to a situation where every country complies with the um, Stability and Growth Pact. This is a difficult period. It's not over. but. My chart early on showed that we have been making good progress and there's no disagreement about the direction. Countries um, will move um, to a balanced budget. If something really exceptional happens like in 2008, 2009, we have seen that this in the fiscal framework we have in Europe, um, a lot can be done. But I consider that to be really exceptional. Um, well, you know me, I, I'm normally not in favor of, of fiscal activism. Um, but in late 2008, I was very much advocating fiscal action. Um, but for me, that was the first and so far only time in my professional life <laughs> that I was in favor. It was a very clear-cut case. So if that happens again, yes. Um, but as a regular feature, I don't see the need. It's interesting. I'll just note, um, in part with support one through open competition, from uh, DG Ekfin, we, we did a book on the future of the euro in 2005, and one of the chapters in there raised the issue that there was insufficient uh, fiscal activism in the euro area, and this was part of the problem. But of course, it also related to something Klaus said in his initial remarks that he was definitely principled on, which was the, uh, I'm allowed to say, hypocrisy of letting France and, Greece, France and Germany get away 
with their violations of the budget rules in the early 2000s when they were applied to other countries. Uh, Hung, and then at the mic. Well, thank you. Uh, Hung Tran from the IAF. My question is to Klaus, but I would like to hear Reza's and Domenico's view as well. The question is, given the improvement in policy term and institutional improvement, particularly for crisis management and resolution in Europe, does Europe need the IMF anymore? But the one, as you said, the resources that the fund can bring to any European country in crisis is very small and dwarfed by the resources of ESM, EFSF, and, and, and the Euro group. Second, the resources from the fund is very costly, short term, not at all suitable for countries in that sustainability crisis. And number three, the technical expertise that the fund used to enjoy, I think that ESM, yourself, um, ECB, um, Commission, ECFIN, uh, staff have picked up a huge amount of experience over the past seven years. So in short, why don't you change your name from ESM to EMF and be done with it? You're right, the situation has changed greatly. I think five, six years ago, the IMF was really needed. Initially, also, the IMF provided one-third of the financing. Now, for the second Greek package and for Cyprus, it's only one-tenth. The rest is coming from EFSF and ESM. The expertise has indeed been developed greatly um, at DG ECFIN. Um, so initially, this, the IMF was really needed, and, um, and um, that's much appreciated. But to go as far and say we will never need the IMF again, I don't support that, because European countries are members of the IMF. And IMF membership brings certain obligations, like providing information, participating in surveillance and Article 4 consultation, and certain rights. The right is to draw on IMF resources in a crisis. Why should European countries say once and for all, we want to give up this right unilaterally? I don't see a need for that. Um, it may mean that if 20 years from now there's another crisis, that it can be handled in Europe, but I would not ex ante give up this right. This question of European Monetary Fund always comes up. Um, people always try to tease me with that. Um, um, we have a different setup in Europe, in a very traditional European sense. We like decentralization. We have different players. We have the Commission. I don't want to recruit 200 economists and do the same work that my former colleagues do in Brussels. I could probably do it, but um, why have this overlap? It's costly. Um, so the Commission is there. The ECB supports the process. This division of labor is working. So um, to put it all in one house, like at the IMF in Washington, where they do it rightly in that way globally, there's no need in Europe. Well, let's mix up the order. Domenico and then Reza. Yeah, uh, so I would say that uh, the Eurozone still needs uh, the IMF uh, for at least a couple of reasons. So the first reason is that uh, it's true that uh, the ESM has been set up. Uh, there's a number of uh, um, you know, fire nets or firewalls, but uh, you know, these are regional arrangements. And regional arrangements uh, also entails regional proximity. This is why you know, historically, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it may be beneficial to outsource conditionality or the monitoring of conditionality to a third sort of more independent party that is located outside the region. And, you know, this has happened in the past in other regions, as I said. Uh, the second reason is that the ESM uh, uh, has a certain financial capacity. Uh, as I uh, hinted before, that might be uh, limited. Uh, it depends really on the problem at hand. And therefore, the IMF uh, does provide uh, an important option uh, for scaling up assistance uh, uh, in that regard. And uh, so I would say, you know, for these two reasons, we may still expect the Eurozone to rely on the IMF in, in, in some fashion. Yeah, raise up. Thanks. Um, the, the question is, in what role are we talking about? The, the fund has traditionally had very good surveillance relationship with, with the Eurozone, with individual countries, uh, but also with the, with the zone as a whole. There is a Eurozone Article 4. And I think that is an incredibly good process. It's an important process, not just for Europe, but also for the rest of the world in terms of having 
uh, independent views of the fund about what is happening in individual countries, but also in the Eurozone as a whole. So I think that's an excellent process, and that is separate from uh, the IMF's dealing with the crisis. Is there a need for the IMF financing at this point in time? No. Uh, does, uh, uh, can you rule out uh, IMF financing in the future in Eurozone? One should not, for precisely the reasons that Klaus has mentioned. Uh, more specifically, you can talk about Greece. Does, is the financing needed by the fund in Greece? Um, I don't think so. It doesn't. Uh, uh, Greece needs uh, uh, long-term financing. In my view, it also needs a, an, a, a solution to its debt. Uh, long-term financing should not be the role of the fund. The fund financing is, is expensive precisely because it's a balance of payments, short-term financing. Great. I'm going to uh, ask the two people at the back mic to each give their question to make sure we get them in as we're coming to the end of our time. Please. Oh, I'm not sure if you have something else to say. I have a question for Klaus. Uh, the first is why do you think that uh, corporate debt in the euro area should uh, come down so we badly need uh, corporate investment? Um, the second is about the, the OMC that um, you rank uh, among the other measures. Uh, in my view, there's a before and after uh, the OMC in, uh, in the euro crisis. And the question is, uh, why did it take so long for the OMC to, to arrive? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, do I see Georges Pinot or another ECB rep here to deal with that? No, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I don't think this works. So yeah, actually it does. It does? Okay. Uh, Piers Bernard from EBRD. Quick question uh, to both Reza and, 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 and Klaus uh, on labor market mobility. You see, this is one area that has not been mentioned, and this is one area where one feels that actually there has been not, not simply no progress, but a, a regression relative to what we had had before the crisis. Even countries like the UK, which was open to labor market mobility, is now closing down increasingly. And that, of course, basically blocks an important equalizing uh, mechanism in the, in the, uh, in the Eurozone and, and in, in the EU in general for, for uh, future uh, European uh, integration. And that also shows that there is a, a political disconnect between the, lo the, the strong uh, uh, European uh, solidarity, as Reza said, and the national feelings, uh, uh, the national electorate feelings um, against uh, more Europeization. I live in London, maybe I'm biased, but one feels on an everyday basis uh, a backlash against uh, labor market mobility, again, going against further European integration. Question mark. Um, so, Klaus, on the uh, first point from the gentleman from Spain, you don't have to defend the ECB. Um, um, no, I have no problem defending the ECB normally. Oh, I do, but okay. Um, <laughs> but that's the difference, maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, the dilemma is there. You, you described it. You said, um, why should corporate debt, why should it come down? We want to see more lending. I think we need to see both. Um, and Spain is not a bad example. We need to, or banks need to take care of their NPLs, as was also said by my colleagues here. Um, in order to create room so that they can do normal lending again. It's tricky, it's part of this difficult transition period, um, but that's what we need, need to see at the same time. Um, maybe I keep it short here. OMT, um, well, I was happy when it arrived in, in August 2012. Um, it was um, very important at that moment. I'm also happy it has not been needed to be implemented. Um, the announcement um, contributed greatly to calm down markets. We would have been prepared with the ECB to implement it. I signed an MOU with Mario Draghi on how to do it, um, the cooperation between ESM and ECB. Um, but it was not needed, so that's perfect. We, we like to have instruments available for crisis management and then not use them. The IMF does the same thing, so that's very good. On labor market mobility, I wonder whether you're a little bit too influenced by where you live in the UK, I assume, um, which is really um, quite different from what I see in the Euro area, where I see a lot more labor mobility in the crisis. Um, certainly people are moving from, from the periphery to core countries much more than ever before the crisis. Um, I happen to have a German, German passport, as you probably know. 
although I haven't lived there for 20 years. Um, but I, I know that big German companies like Bosch, Siemens, um, sent recruiting missions to Spain to get people because the German labor market is so tight. So this is ongoing, supported by the government. It's happening. And you see it in the numbers in a striking way that it's not often noticed in the media. Germany, until 2010, so let's say till the crisis started, had a decline in its overall population every year of two to 300,000. Since 2011, Germany is growing again by three to 400,000 people a year. So this is a swing of six to 700,000 people. This is like 0.8% of the population, um, it's amazing. It's a tremendous swing. Sorry, sorry, Klaus, just, just to be clear, since you're quoting specific numbers, are you talking about growth in residents within German borders, or are you talking growth in German citizens here? In residents. Thank you. So this is only explainable through the crisis because the birth rate has not moved. Um, it's lower, low even by European standards. So the crisis has actually led to significant more labor mobility than we have seen for in a long time in Europe. Um, on top of that, you have the, the um, very clear um, trend that among academics through the Erasmus program, um, people who study at universities and then find jobs somewhere in Europe, a lot more mobility than before. So to describe all this as a general decline in labor mobility in the Euro area is just wrong. Okay. Um we're at our witching hour. Do Reza or Domenico have anything particular? No? Um, nothing particular, I, I think, on this side. Yeah, and Klaus, I think, deservedly gets the last word. Um, thank you all for joining us for the start of the exciting season. We know there are many events, including apparently a particularly lively press conference for Mr. Draghi in Frankfurt. Um, but we're very glad to have you with us today. Uh, I'm grateful to CG and to Domenico Lombardi for joining us in supporting this, this effort. I'm very grateful to Reza Maldadem for his first appearance on this stage since he left the fund. And in particular, I'm grateful to Klaus Regling for choosing us as a venue to talk about building Europe's future, just as he has been so critical in building Europe's past and present. So thank you very much. Thank you.